As Lord Durham sails for England, a second rebellion breaks out in Lower Canada. The Hunter's Lodge attacks the manor house of the Seigneury of Beauharnois. Inside are the Seigneur's son, Edward Ellis, and his wife, Jane. She sees her captors as French revolutionaries. My sister and I were left seated en chemise de nuit and robe de chambre in the midst of five or six of the most ruffian-looking men I ever saw, except in my dreams of Robespierre, and without a single being to give us either advice or assistance. But the Patriot victories are short-lived. The hunters soon head for the border. The rekindled rebellion has been snuffed out in less than a week. In Upper Canada, the Hunter's Lodge carries out a series of raids along the American border. Fort Malden, Fighting Island, Thousand Islands, Short Hills, Prescott. But their determination is broken once and for all by a decisive defeat at Windsor. Julie Papineau has joined her husband in the United States. She writes to her son, Amédé. You say you do not understand why this country has not risen up en masse. After all, the people were told that they would be provided with arms and money, and that a great army would come from the States. They were told a thousand tales. The whole region south of Montreal pays a high price for the second uprising. A Montreal Herald journalist describes the reprisals. All the country back of La Prairie presented the frightful spectacle of a vast expanse of livid flame. It is sad to reflect on the terrible consequences of the revolt, of the irreparable ruin of so great a number of human beings, whether innocent or guilty. Nevertheless, the supremacy of the laws must be maintained inviolate, the integrity of the empire respected, and peace and prosperity assured to the English, even at the expense of the whole Canadian people. A thousand Glengarry Highlanders, militiamen from Upper Canada, burn and pillage everything in their path. Jane Ellis, no longer a captive, is witness to the devastation. The Glengarry's boast is no fear of our being forgotten, for we have left a trail six miles broad all through the country. They seem to be a wild set of men. One of them told me that the houses they had spared in coming down the country, they would surely burn in going back. Hundreds of rebels are convicted of high treason. In Upper Canada, 17 men are executed. In Lower Canada, 12 die on the gallows. An idealistic notary, Chevalier de Lorimier, is one of them. I have only a few hours left to live, but I wish to share this precious time between my religious duties and those I owe my compatriots. For them I die the inglorious death of the common murderer. For them, I leave behind my young children and my wife who have no means of support. And for them, I die crying. Long live freedom. Long live independence. A Canadian era, a More than 140 prisoners from Upper and Lower Canada are deported. In 
the fall of 1839, they leave Quebec for a penal colony in Australia. Inspired by the exile's fate, a young man named Antoine Gérin Lajoie writes a song that will become famous. Si tu vois mon pays, mon pays malheureux, si tu vois mon Eighteen thirty nine is a time of despair and bitterness for both Canadas. Bad harvests have left many farmers destitute. The failure of the rebellions seems to have dashed all the reformers' hopes. The final tally paints a bleak picture. More than 200 of their comrades dead on the battlefields or on the scaffold. Hundreds of others sentenced to exile. The opponents of reform have won a decisive victory. Then, in London, Lord Durham submits his report. It is not by weakening, but strengthening the influence of the people on its government that I believe that harmony is to be restored, where dissension has so long prevailed, and a regularity and vigor, hitherto unknown, introduced into the administration of these provinces. To everyone's astonishment, Durham accepts one of the reformers' central demands. He recommends that the governor's advisers, the men who actually run the government, should have the support of the elected assembly. In Lower Canada, he sees another, possibly more serious, problem. I expected to find a contest between a government and a people. I found two nations warring in the bosom of a single state. I found a struggle not of principles but of races. And I perceived that it would be idle to attempt any amelioration of laws or institutions until we could first succeed in terminating the deadly animosity that now separates the inhabitants of Law Canada into the hostile divisions of French and English. Durham proposes uniting the two Canadas so French-speaking members of Parliament will be in the minority. Assimilation, he believes, would benefit the French Canadians, a people he sees as having no history and no literature. The language, the laws, the character of the North American continent are English and every race but English appears there in a condition of inferiority. It is to elevate them from that inferiority that I desire to give the Canadians our English character. London welcomes the idea of union, seeing it as a way of settling the French problem once and for all. But there will be no movement towards self-government. The reformers in British North America are bitterly disappointed. In Nova Scotia, Joseph Howe refuses to be daunted by London's decision. 
but for the moment, he has a more immediate problem to deal with. The Halifax elite are trying once again to silence him. This time, he won't be defending himself in court, but with a pistol in a duel. During the political struggles in which I have been engaged, several attempts have been made to make me pay the penalty of life for the steady maintenance of my opinions. Hitherto, Providence has spared my life. This may not always be the case. I feel that I am bound to hazard my life rather than blight all prospects of being useful. If I fall, cherish the principles I have taught. Forgive my errors. Protect my children. Howe has brashly declared that the children of the rich are no better than the apprentices in his printing shop. His words have outraged Halifax society. As the offended party, Howe's adversary, John Halliburton, takes the first shot. well that ends well. I never intended to fire at him and would not for 10,000 pounds. All that was necessary was for me to let them see that the reformers could teach them a lesson of coolness and moderation. Thousands of miles from Halifax, two other reformers are preparing for a new political battle. Robert Baldwin is a lawyer, the son of one of Toronto's richest families. Late that autumn, Baldwin is trying to pick up the pieces of the great reform project. He sends a letter that will change the course of history. Baldwin proposes an alliance with the Lower Canadian Patriot. Together, they will command a reform majority in the new House of Assembly. There is, and must be, no question of races. It were madness on one side and guilt, deep guilt on both to make such a question. The reformers of Upper Canada are ready to make every allowance for the unfortunate state of things and are resolved, as I believe them to be, to unite with their lower Canadian brethren cordially as friends and to afford every assistance in obtaining justice. In Lower Canada, most of the Patriot leaders are in exile. Baldwin sends his message to one of the few men in a position to carry on the struggle, Louis-Hippolyte Lafontaine. It is in the interest of the reformers of both provinces to come together in the legislature in a spirit of peace, union, friendship and fraternity. United action is needed now more than ever. La Fontaine has risen from modest origins to become a prosperous lawyer and an influential politician. He sees the union of the Canadas as a despotic act. He believes it is designed to make French Canadians a permanent minority in the new assembly. But Baldwin's letter gives him hope. I have no doubt that the advocates of reform in Upper Canada feel the need, as we do, to join forces, and that in the first sitting of the legislature, they will show us some unequivocal evidence of this, which I hope will be the sign of a lasting and mutual bond of trust. In 1841, the Act of Union comes into force. One 